Hi there. I'm going to talk to you here about Emil Durkheim and uh, it'll accompany the PowerPoint that I posted on iLearn. I hope that you'll find this useful for uh, understanding Durkheim's uh, readings, you know, the ideas and um, for your papers, ultimately. So we're going to go to the screen share function here and take a look at the PowerPoint. So the, the first thing, you know, I would say about Emil Durkheim is, is that this is somebody who's very different from Karl Marx. You know, Karl Marx, the first major theorist we had looked at was really fashioned himself as a revolutionary and who proposed revolutionary solutions for society. Um, Durkheim was a bit more conservative, certainly, and, and um, more of like a professional who really wanted to establish sociology as a legitimate science within the university system. His initial background, you know, came out of philosophy, uh, so similar to Marx in that respect, um, but coming through, you know, the most prestigious college in all of France. Um, and, you know, as he got a little bit older and as new kind of developments were happening in the sciences, he wanted to pursue sociology um, and to help really kind of develop sociology in the late 19th century as something that was more um, scientific, uh, perhaps a bit more practical also than philosoph philosophy. So he continued to maintain, as we'll see, an interest in these big philosophical questions, but he wanted to do it through a more uh, scientific, more uh, rational, um, perhaps more even also more democratic and less elitist form um, than in philosophy. Durkheim's, you know, politics, um, again, were more conservative than, than Marx's, certainly. Um, he did identify with some of the goals of, of socialism, um, but really, above all, tried to fashion himself as a more of a, like a scientific professional who was more neutral or objective or kind of st stood on the sidelines. Um, of the social and political debates of his time. Uh, he believed, you know, that, that sociologists should basically be, be committed to education and this kind of scientific objective uh, kind of approach. So, so in that sense, again, it's very, very much unlike Karl Marx. Um, his passion was for this, this dispassionate, you know, objective kind of scientific research. Um, still, you know, he did find himself in some controversies in his time, especially just his, his whole idea that any um, social thing, including religion, could be studied from a scientific sociological perspective. Even, even that was in itself controversial um, and in his time and in the way in which he, you know, sort of elevated uh, scientific knowledge um, was itself kind of controversial in a, in a country where there was still a, a deep commitment to uh, Catholicism and, um, you know, to a sort of a religious way of seeing the world. Uh, as we'll see at the end of this lecture, he came around to looking at um, these forms of uh, religious thought and uh, religious ways of making sense of the world uh, in his last book. Um, a key influence for him is Auguste Comte, who we talked about at the very beginning of the semester, you know, who um, came much earlier than Durkheim uh, you know, maybe lived maybe 70 or 80 years young uh, before Durkheim. So, you know, they would have never met, but he was a key influence in his writings 
uh, with his idea that society is this thing that should be studied scientifically as if it has its own laws and dynamics. Um, and for Comte, this idea that society is a, is a thing in itself um, is not just reducible to the sum of the individuals who, who live in it. You know, that kind of society kind of like has its own laws and, and its own dynamics, its own laws of motion, um, irrespective of the individuals who compose it. So um, Comte was, the, you know, as we talked about earlier in the semester, sort of the first one to propose that sociology could be this thing that, that studied society from a scientific perspective um, in the same way that the physical uh, world was being studied by the natural scientists, you know, by chemists, physicists, biologists, and so forth. He believed sociologists um, could study society in this same kind of scientific uh, way. And that ultimately sociology would be the queen of the sciences because it would synthesize all of this knowledge from all of these different disciplines to kind of form like the highest uh, form of knowledge um, about the world and um, about how individuals operate within society. So Durkheim kind of tried to really elaborate on that um, vision that Comte had initially proposed, uh, but Comte had only kind of, you know, sketched it out. Remember, he had spent a lot of time in mental institutions and things like that. So he never really like fully elaborated this uh, idea of sociology in the same way that Durkheim would do like 70 or 80 years later, Dur Durkheim much more kind of like systematized this, this kind of knowledge. Um, there's basically two really key ideas at the core of Durkheim's um, social theory. Uh, one is, is social facts, uh, which I mentioned, you know, a minute ago. Um, these things about society that can be studied in a scientific perspective. Um, these conditions and circumstances that are external to the individual. Um, the external part is really key in the sense that these are things that we don't really control. They are outside of us. They are things that existed, you know, maybe before we were born and they'll live on after we die. Um, they are objective forces, uh, objective facts of the social world that are bigger than us and that we can't really control. Um, so they're external to the individual in the sense that they determine our lives and they shape our, our course of action. Um, they are things, again, that, that, that shape the very fabric of our lives of in, as individuals, uh, but we don't really have, you know, a lot or any control over them. They are just the facts of society. And then the other key concept is solidarity, um, which is, you know, essentially the, the, the cohesion, like the glue that holds society uh, together, that holds social groups together. And we looked at this in the video um, that you watched and that you wrote a forum post about these differences between mechanical and organic forms of solidarity that characterize um, different stages of development in society and specifically different stages of development in the division of labor. So basically that as a, a division of labor becomes more complex within society, as societies become more modern and complicated, um, there's more of an organic sense of solidarity that takes hold. Whereas in more simple or more primitive societies, where there's a very simple division of labor, um, then you have what Durkheim calls more organic forms of solidarity. Um, the kind of the glue that holds society together or is supposed to hold together is like a shared moral code. Um, in other words, that everyone in society or, or most people in society 
agree on these basic principles of right and wrong, of, of good and evil. Um, this is why religion is, is such an, an important element in so many different societies in terms of social solidarity, because religion is the thing that provides this shared moral code that kind of holds uh, society together. And we will see that one of Durkheim's questions, as it was for Kant, was um, like, what are the dangers of modern society breaking down if we don't have this shared moral code embodied in something like religion? You know, what are the, the dangers of society collapsing into chaos and anarchy and just extreme individualism where people just do whatever they want and there's no uh, regard for the greater social good. So these ideas about mechanical and organic solidarity are laid out in the book, The Division of Labor and Society in uh, 1893, Durkheim's first major book. Um, in your reading, it gives you a pretty straightforward excerpt of, um, uh, of these concepts in chapter, wait for it, six, chapter 16. Um, he starts by talking about the function of the division of labor, and then uh, on page 225 begins to talk about uh, mechanical solidarity that takes place in these forms of these like traditional societies, these kind of more simple societies where there's a simple division of labor, you know, maybe just like a division between like hunters and gatherers, this is a really common uh, division of labor um, throughout the history of the world has been this, you know, hunting and gathering kind of um, division. Uh, and in these kinds of societies, there's, there's really no place for individual differentiation. Uh, they are based on what Durkheim calls solidarity by similarities. Basically that like everybody's the same. Um, and that creates a really strong sense of bond um, within people in that society. But the the downside of it, I suppose you could say, is, is that there's no room for people to be different, to be individualistic. Um, it's, there's kind of more like a herd mentality. So then um, on page uh, 229, he begins talking about uh, organic solidarity, or as he says, solidarity arising from the division of labor. Um, and this is what is characterized in more advanced, more modern societies where there's a complicated division of labor. Um, there is a greater uh, capacity for individual differentiation. So people can, you know, specialize in all kinds of different forms of work. Um, they can also, you know, have more kind of like personalized lifestyles that um, express their individuality. Uh, the downside of organic solidarity is that you don't have that same sense of kind of a, a social bond um, or um, there's like a danger or a risk that the social bond, the social fabric could be uh, frayed because you have so many individuals kind of doing their own thing. Uh, Durkheim, as, as you remember, from maybe from the video, tries to solve this problem by saying, well, you know, organic solidarity is this thing where society, you know, modern society can be like a functioning organism, like the human body, you know, where we have all these organs within us that, that perform a different role. They all do their own thing, but they are interdependent in the sense that they all have to work together. And if so, you know, if one organ of the body, like, you know, the lungs or the heart or, you know, um, the liver, if, if any of these organs uh, break down, then the other organs have to sort of compensate and work uh, 
um, in different ways in order to make up for that um, change. So the organs in our body are very much interdependent on one another. Um, and, you know, we really realize that when we get sick or something like that. And he's saying that, that similarly, a society is full of people who are um, interdependent with one another, even though we may all be kind of doing our own thing. And, you know, we may not have like a close sense of community. You know, we all need each other in order for the society to function in a healthy way. Uh, in the same way that like we need our organs in our body to function in a healthy way. We need them to work together. So he is at least tries to provide a kind of a, a hopeful answer about how societies can continue, can continue to have solidarity, even if the different individual parts um, have a, a different role, have a more complicated division of labor. Durkheim believes it's, it's still possible for an or, a modern society to have this kind of organic solidarity that holds it together. Um, the example, I would say the best way to think about this division between mechanical and organic solidarity is, you know, to think about like the difference between living and rural or urban societies. So like in rural societies, you know, small towns, little villages, you know, places like that, um, there's often, you know, a very deep sense of community and tradition and people take care of each other and look out for one another. Um, but the downside is, you know, again, like if you're in some way individually different from the rest of the pack from the rest of the group, um, it can feel really um, suffocating for individuals. Um, an, an urban society, you know, is, is one that is more embodied in this organic solidarity kind of concept, you know, where we're all kind of doing our own thing and working different jobs and have different skills and living different kinds of lifestyles um, but, you know, uh, hopefully we still recognize that we are interdependent on, uh, each other, um, that in some, in some ways the, the pandemic has really kind of, um, put the exclamation point on how interdependent we are with each other, even with people we don't know, right? That's why we wear masks. Uh, it is not just like, you know, so that we don't get sick, but also we recognize that we are interdependent and can have effects on other people. And so, you know, even if we are healthy, we wear a mask because we don't want to spread, uh, you know, COVID to, you know, our neighbor's grandmother uh, or somebody who could be more vulnerable um, should they contract the disease. So, um, I think, you know, COVID has been a big lesson in interdependence, social interdependence. Um, I don't know if America has really passed that test. Uh, in some ways, we've kind of not, we, we've, it's, it's also kind of exemplified some of Durkheim's worst fears. Um, Durkheim's worst fears is, was that, you know, as individuals, we would just all kind of do our own thing and not care about our neighbor. Um, and, uh, you know, just do whatever we want and just say to hell with everybody else. And in some ways that, that has also happened um, clearly with parts of the pandemic. So this is an old sociological distinction, um, this mechanic, mechanical and organic solidarity distinction has a long history in sociology. Uh, a German guy by the name of Ferdinand Tonez um, elaborated a similar kind of concept of the Gesellschaft versus Gemeinschaft society. Gesellschaft was more like the urban uh, society based on complicated division of labor and, and organic solidarity. The Gemeinschaft was more of like a mechanical solidarity based on, you know, rural small town living. <clears throat> 
they're basically a, a, a way of trying to theorize um, the effects of more and more people leaving the countryside and moving to these big cities where people don't necessarily know each other and they don't share the same religion or the same language or the same culture or the same habits. Um, sociologists have been trying to theorize that distinction um, really, you know, since the, this time of Durkheim and Thomas. So, um, you know, here is the, you know, the basic summary of the differences between mechanical and organic solidarity. Um, you know, I think the, the film does a good job of sort of like breaking these down for you in terms of mechanical solidarity being based on likeness and organic solidarity being based on interdependence. Um, and uh, in organic solidarity, there is more room for individual difference. Um, whereas in mechanical solidarity, it's more like a small traditional society in the sense that there is, um, it's based on just people being similar. The next uh, major book that Durkheim wrote is one where he elaborates the idea of social facts and his whole kind of scientific method for studying society. Uh, and the name of that, that book is The Rules of Sociological Method. Um, and that is excerpted in your reader uh, in chapter 15. Um, and where, you know, he begins right away with talking about this concept of social facts. He basically elaborates a whole kind of method um, for what sociology should be as a scientific discipline. That's why, you know, like this, this idea of the rules of the method, like what basically like what are the rules sociologists should do um, in studying society. And so he basically says like, you know, first of all, sociology is this distinct field of study, uh, unlike, you know, psychology or the natural sciences or anthropology, that sociology is its own kind of unique thing based on the scientific study of society, um, based on also, as it says here in the second point, applying the methods uh, from the natural sciences to the study of society, to the social sciences. And um, this is distinct from something like, uh, not just from the natural sciences, but from like psychology, where with psychology, the emphasis is always more on the individual and the individual consciousness. Whereas for Durkheim, uh, as it was for Comte before him, Sociology is a distinct field of study in the sense that society has its own internal dynamics, its own laws of motion. It abides by its own characteristics and therefore must be studied as a thing in its own right, as opposed to just the sum of, an, of its individual parts. Um, as far as this thing about social facts, uh, which, you know, he begins to elaborate, um, you know, he starts off the, the, this chapter on page 201, talking about social facts, and then goes a little bit deeper on page 203, posing the question, what is a social fact? Um, and then gives, you know, a, a pretty uh, lengthy explanation of this concept of social fact, along with several examples, you know, from about page 203 to page 209 to 10, something like that. Um, so he says, you know, basically like social facts are these things that are uh, general throughout the extent of a given society um, at, a given, uh, at a given stage of the evolution of that society and uh, that a social uh, fact is marked by any marker, any manner of action capable of exercising over the ex individual exterior constraint. Again, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, exterior constraint is the really key part of the social fact. It's the part of society that um, 
you know, kind of ha- is, is basically bigger than us, is, is more powerful than us, and therefore constrains what we do as individuals. Um, one of the best examples right now uh, for American society in 21st century, uh, the, the best example of a social fact is race. Um, race in many ways is a biological fiction right? It's something that is socially constructed in the sense that like there's no real like scientific or natural basis for race, but race is very much a social fact. Um, So as much as race may be a biological fiction, it is a uh, social fact in the sense that it shapes everything from the kind of quality of education that people get, the kind of quality of health care that they get, the kinds of jobs they can or can't get, the kinds of housing they can or can't get, um, the way that we're treated by the police or the way that we're treated by uh, the criminal justice system. In all of these cases, even though race isn't like natural or biologically or scientifically real it's treated as a fact within society a a fact that kind of takes on a life of its own and exercises this exterior constraint over the individuals uh, involved you know so that um, people uh, can't just simply wish away uh, race. Um, it's the way that society categorizes and uh, puts people into uh, a hierarchy and into these structural inequalities that we see operating to this very day. Uh, another um, example that Durkheim talks about in the rules of sociological method, especially towards the end of the chapter, around page 213. Um, He talks about crime as a fact of society and makes this really kind of counterintuitive argument that crime is actually inevitable or normal in all societies because um, crime and, and especially like the punishment of crime is something that defines the moral boundaries of society, that it communicates to the rest of society what is acceptable or not acceptable behavior. And so this is why so often the punishment for crimes has been public. Um, It's been a way of societies basically saying, you know, by publicly punishing someone, saying to everybody else in the society, Like, this is what happens if you transgress these moral boundaries. Like, you know, you have to wear a scarlet letter, you know, or you're publicly flogged in the, in the town square, um, or, you know, many more horrific forms of uh, torture and public punishment have been doled out, um, you know, in the past. But even, you know, today, you know, we have more kind of like public forms of ridicule or, you know, um, calling people out on social media or canceling people on social media. These are all ways in which societies, it is just a fact of social life that um, punishment of crime uh, or punishment of some kind of moral transgression is done publicly as a way to kind of set an example or send a message to everyone in the society. And that's why Durkheim says basically a society free from crime is totally impossible. Like even if you had a society of complete angels, um, there would have to be some kind of crime or some laws or punishment Um, because the function of that punishment is to affirm these collective sentiments, these boundaries 
um, that society needs for its existence. You know, in other words, by saying like what is unacceptable or what is immoral or what is illegal, society is defining the boundary of what is moral, what is legal, what is permissible, what is acceptable, and, and, and so forth. Um, that those moral boundaries, in other words, are defined negatively um, by the punishment of people who transgress them. Um, his next major book is a, is a major landmark in um, statistical method, in the use of statistical methods in sociology um, and using like government data and looking at, um, you know, using more kind of like quantitative and comparative methods. Uh, and that is his study of suicide. Um, this was really integral to Durkheim developing sociology as a field of study that was distinct from psychology um, in the sense that he takes this thing, suicide, that you know we generally think of as a, as a really intensely individual act, you know, something that people do for really personal um, psychological reasons. And he demonstrates that actually, in fact, um, suicide has also has a social component to it as well, in the sense that certain societies have higher or lower suicide rates at different times. So if suicide was simply an individual personal thing, we wouldn't expect like there to be social trends, you know, where the suicide go rate goes up at certain times or in certain societies and it goes down you know, in other societies or at other times, we would expect it to be pretty constant. Um, but because it is affected, because it does go up and down at various times and places, it begins to um, uh, tip, uh, tip us off to the fact that uh, suicide is this kind of social and not simply psychological or personal thing. In modern industrial society, he believed that um, the modern industrial societies are at risk of higher rates of suicide from a lack of integration, um, where basically the individual finds themselves kind of alone and cut off and not really um, a part of uh, society or any kind of a community or any kind of support system. Um, and then anomi, um, which has to do with a lack of moral regulation. So he talks about these different kinds of um, uh, forms of suicide that he believes are chronic in modern industrial society, um, forms of egoism and forms of anomi which we'll elaborate here on in the slides to come. So um, the lack of moral regulation uh, and social regulation and the lack of uh, social integration are the things that characterize modern societies. And in their most extreme form, they can cause uh, uptick, uh, upticks in the suicide rate. Um, so one thing that's important to note, it's like, it, it's not like Durkheim saying that there wasn't suicide before in like pre-modern societies. He's saying like, it kind of took a different form that in pre-modern societies, people were more likely to kill themselves for different reasons. Um, mostly because, you know, they had brought shame on the group um, or they didn't want to be a liability to the group. Um, it had more to do with their kind of their collective group identity. Individuals conceived of themselves as being part of a, a group, a part of a collective, you know, part of a tribe or a community or a religion. And so they were more likely to kill themselves when they brought dishonor um, onto that group. Uh, or if they were, you know, like sick or injured and, and didn't want to be like a, a burden 
on to the social group. Um, Durkheim says that in modern societies, it's more likely that people kill themselves because they find themselves alone and like detached from society so that they don't have a sense of community or a support system. Um, they don't, they aren't integrated into society and there isn't a sense of moral regulation in the sense of like religion or some kind of higher set of beliefs that can give people like, um, you know, a roadmap to how to make sense of their lives. So these egoistic uh, and animistic forms are more characteristic of modern industrial societies. He sort of sp spells it out here in this, in this graph um, that shows you with these two variables of integration and regulation. Um, integration basically being like the extent to which individuals are connected with the society. Um, integration, you know, can be kind of defined by this relationship between the individual and the community. Um, so there can be too much integration, um, which may result in something like altruistic society, uh, suicide. Altruistic suicide is kind of like when the individual gives themselves up, sacrifices themselves for the good uh, of the group. Uh, maybe like in a cult um, or something like that might be an extreme form of altruistic suicide. Um, but egoistic suicide is what, is what is much more common in our modern industrial society. And that's where there's not enough integration. Um, and that's where the individual feels themselves kind of cut off um, or um, disconnected from the community. And then the other axis is one of regulation. So regulation has more to do with like there being external constraints, especially like religion or some other belief system that, you know, kind of shapes individual consciousness. So again, if there's too much regulation, um, it, you know, too much more regulation, people might commit suicide because they get fatalistic. Um, let's say they belong to like, you know, a doomsday cult or some religious cult that tells them like, you know, the end of the world is coming um, or, you know, that they have to, um, uh, you know, in, engage in, in some, uh, you know, act of, of suicide because, um, you know, it is, it is like their fate you know, is, it is a fatalistic sense where people um, believe that like there is no escape, there is no way for things to get better. So that would be if they're kind of like over-regulated, like, you know, probably the most extreme example would be like a doomsday cult. Um, but anomic suicide is one where there is, is he says like not enough regulation. Um, and here it's where uh, there isn't, you know, society doesn't provide a, a kind of a, a, a compass, like a moral compass or a roadmap for individuals to make sense of um, why bad things happen. And so a suicide may result here as a result of like the social equilibrium not being strong enough. Um, so a breakdown in the economy, uh, a bankruptcy, a loss of a job, a loss of family, those kinds of circumstances where suddenly the individual finds themselves without um, a stable sense of where they fit into society. So this uh, relationship between moral integration and moral regulation, um, honestly, is pretty close. Um, I think integration has more to do with like the social connection that people enter into kind of more voluntarily, whereas regulation, I think, has more to do 
with like external constraints, um, regulation in, in the sense of like religion or um, maybe nationalism or some kind of like external set of beliefs that the individual uh, inherits um, and uh, that the individual, you know, is kind of just born into. So, you know, in modern societies, regulation and integration is going to be more weak. In pre-modern societies, integration and regulation are going to be stronger. Um, it's not that there isn't suicide in both of modern and pre-modern societies. It's just that there's suicide for like different reasons. Um, and as I said, with anomic suicide, since it is one of the questions for your um, paper assignment, you know, it has to do with this lack of regulation in modern industrial society. Um, Durkheim says basically, uh, I'll take you to the um, part where he talks about this. It's basically part three of this chapter 18. Um, on suicide, where he talks about uh, anomic suicide, basically on, on page 261 until the end of the chapter on page 264, right? So that here he talks about, you know, kind of the, the, the fun function of society is to um, limit or constrain the individual uh, and our needs and, and desires he actually says that back on um, page 258 of the reading. Um, so that, you know, like in, in pre-modern societies, people were poor and they were oppressed and they were unequal, um, but they more or less would accept it if they perceived that this was because it was what like God wanted, or, you know, it was just like the way things were or the way things like, nature had dictated, you know, people would accept those oppressive conditions if they perceived them to be just and legitimate. Um, that's what we mean by, uh, you know, a sense of regulation. The, the issue with um, modern capitalist industrial societies, and this is what he starts talking about on page 261, is that it eliminates uh, those previous sources of social constraint. Now, you know, there are no longer any of those old traditional limits to individual acquisition and greed. People can't, everyone can imagine themselves, you know, getting wealthy, getting famous, getting powerful. Um, and so people have, you know, a much higher ceiling in terms of their expectations for success. Uh, and at the same time, um, the previous forms of regulation, especially religion or the other moral forces um, have become weaker uh, under capitalism. These forces that you know, used to constrain people's needs and used to give people a, you know, more of a religious sense of purpose, um, those are gone. And so now it's kind of like, you know, people, you know, they want it all and, and nothing is good enough. Um, and so there's just like no constraints on people's, you know, desire for material acquisition. Um, and then when people fail to get rich or they fail to get, you know, famous or, you know, they fail to get a million followers or whatever their goal is, um, it more often causes people than to, than to blame themselves. You know, they don't blame God or blame nature or blame the king. Uh, they are more likely to internalize that sense of failure. That, that's, that's especially prevalent in American society, right? Where we're all told that, you know, we have these individual opportunities to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and, you know, achieve the American dream and, you know, rise up to a higher level. But then if we don't do that, then like, it's, it's like, it's, it's our fault. We're, we're taught to kind of internalize that sense of failure. Um, 
And this sort of thing Durkheim thinks is, is very dangerous in terms of its connection with anomic suicide. And I would say that um, insofar as there has been an uptick in the suicide rate in the United States, um, even before the pandemic, um, it's been of these more kind of anomic forms of suicide. It's, it's been a lot of middle-aged um, and older people, especially like older men um, who, you know, for one reason or another, like their uh, dreams and, and hopes for success didn't work out. And um, they have engaged more and more in what they call now uh, deaths of despair. So, you know, even if people don't directly like commit suicide, they die of, you know, opiate overdoses or um, drunk driving accidents or, you know, other kinds of things that indicate um, what they call, you know, a, a death of despair. And, and death of despair has been uh, on the rise in American society uh, for the last couple of decades. So, that uh, hope maybe puts uh, a little bit of this idea of the anomic suicide in perspective. Um, the last book that Durkheim writes uh, that honestly is my favorite, um, I, I think in some ways is most important, is called The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. And here basically Durkheim develops a theory of culture, uh, a theory of culture like in general, um, based on his observations about religion um, and a sort of like a comparative study of different religions around the world. And his questions are kind of like, what, you know, what does religion do for people uh, in different parts of the world in terms of like its social function. Like what is the, the function of religion in terms of creating order, like being a glue, being the basis of social solidarity? How has religion helped create a sense of social togetherness among people in all these different societies you know, throughout history and, and societies in different parts of the world, no matter what that religion was. Um, he says one of the common universal things about religion is, is that it functions as a basis of social solidarity. So he wants to look at what these common elementary forms are of religious life. And um, they are the things that, that create a sense of social bond and, and also help people create meaning. And so these are these concepts of, of collective representations uh, of the symbolic opposition between the sacred and the profane, um, of the concept of, of the ritual or the ceremony, and then finally of collective effervescence. Uh, and those are the concepts we'll talk about here in the remaining slides. And the, the major basis for Durkheim's um, empirical study of religion, this comparative study of religion was, was studying the Aboriginal people of uh, Australia and the different forms of like totemistic religion. Um, totemism is kind of like when, um, you know, an, an animal, uh, you know, a, a, a bird or an animal or, you know, some other natural um, spirit might come to kind of represent the group, you know, represent a tribe so that, you know, our tribe is like the, the people of the eagle or, you know, the people of the bear or something like that, you know, so where, where people have an animal as like their, you know, a group of people have like an animal as their spiritual symbol. Um, and these had been, you know, studied by many anthropologists and, you know, looked at as kind of oftentimes, honestly, kind of dismissed as being like primitive or simple religion. And Durkheim looked closer and, and 
said that, you know, actually these are, these are quite complex, they are quite meaningful, and in some ways they, they hold the key to understanding these questions about what it is that religion um, does uh, for a society in terms of its social function of social solidarity. So in tracing these origins, Durkheim is trying to um, use religion as a key to kind of opening up a, a whole set of larger philosophical questions, um, a general theory of knowledge that addresses um, these deeply rooted philosophical questions about thought and action uh, of time and space. He says that like, you know, our categories of time and space, our, our sense of cause and effect, the, these categories that we use to make sense of the world and to give meaning to the world um, and without which we wouldn't be able to act without those kinds of categories. Durkheim says, you know, basically these categories of understanding um, are all socially constructed, you know, that they are not natural. They are not simply given. They are things that we learn um, and internalize through the process of socialization. So he's really trying to take these, these, these ideas that go way back to, you know, people like the Greek uh, philosopher Aristotle, you know, talked about these, these categories of understanding that, that we have to have these categories of understanding to basically like help us think and help us make sense of the world around us um, and help, you know, create meaning out of what would otherwise be a really chaotic existence. Um, and Durkheim is, is introducing now the sociological element to this and saying that like looking at how these categories of understanding are, are socially constructed, how they are, how they are learned um, and passed down, especially through things like religion. So um, the concept of collective representations is one that is um, especially important in this regard and, and is discussed here in um, the reading, which is chapter 17 on um, the elementary forms of religious life. Um, he talks about these categories of understanding on page 246 and 247. And then on page 248, he begins to talk about these, these concepts of collective uh, representations. Actually, maybe like on page 247, he starts talking about these, these collective representations around this section. Um, 246 to 249, we'll say more generally. But basically Durkheim is saying with this, this whole concept of collective representations that, you know, like that they, they are basically like the, the symbols or the objects, you know, wh whether it's like a flag or, you know, a, a totem pole or, you know, like a, a cross or, or some other religious symbol um, maybe a sacred text like a, a Bible or the Quran, um, but it's some object or some symbol that represents the social group as a whole, um, whether that's a community, a tribe, or a group of religious believers, you know, that um, all social groups have some kind of uh, collective representation that is meant to symbolize their existence. You know, um, usually I would say like religious symbols or, or flags. Uh, flags are really important for this kind of thing. And um, in the context of religion, uh, we talk about a division between the sacred and the profane, whereby the sacred are, the, you know, the objects, the symbols, the the, the totems that are believed to have some kind of divine, you know, some kind of maybe supernatural or religious significance. And so we know something is sacred when, um, you know, maybe it only makes a special appearance during a certain kind of ritual and like people are not allowed to touch, you know, whatever the sacred object is. Um, there's, you know, usually a sense of like, um, of like ceremony 
um, and of like reverence, you know, uh, towards the thing itself. Um, that it's something that we are kind of like in awe of, um, something that has a kind of an aura that surrounds it. So the presence of the sacred or being in the presence of the sacred inspires a kind of an awe in, in those who believe in it. And it's in opposition to, you know, the, the profane um, and the profane is just kind of more like the commonplace everyday kind of existence, the sort of humdrum of day-to-day -day thing, right? So, so the, the sacred is special um, in the way that the profane is, is not, right? The profane is just, you know, like if you think about the word profanity, right? It's, it's like the opposite of something that is um, sacred or holy or divine. Um, the profane is, is something that is, is low. Um, it's something that is uh, like dirty. Um, so all different cultures have ways of distinguishing between the sacred and the profane. And, and so some objects or some animals, you know, might have sacred significance, like the sacred cow in India, for example. Um, but the thing that's common to all religion and all cultures is that they have some way of making this symbolic opposition between the sacred and the profane. And that opposition between the sacred and the profane is the basis for all of their um, symbolic categorizations of making sense of the world. So the ultimate function of these collective representations is to hold society together. And remember, this is the thing that Durkheim is most concerned with. He wants to understand you know, that society has its own dynamics, its own laws of motion, it's not reducible to the sum of the individual parts. And therefore we have to know like what kind of things will help a society stay together? What will help a society to function in a healthy kind of way? Um, and so in this sense of the sacred and the profane and, and these, this, these collective representations, the idea is that they, they, their function, their role is to help provide the basic categories of thought uh, and forms of meaning that make social life possible. Again, to go to the previous slide when referencing Aristotle, these collective representations basically create the, the, the form, the categories of understanding that help us make sense of the world so that we can go out and, and act in the world. <clears throat> the other um, concept that he mentions, and this is a bit more on like page 251, uh, well, maybe about page 250, maybe from like page 250 to 253, towards the end of this chapter, he talks about these this thing he calls collective effervescence or effervescence, um, where he talks about like collective gatherings of religious believers that reach, you know, a kind of an intensity um, that induce a state of effervescence. And, and the, 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 um, the slide here is quoting from, a, uh, from the text on page 251 in talking about, you know, when vital energies are overexcited and passions are more active and sensations are stronger. Basically Durkheim is talking about like that in every religion um, or in all sorts of different religions at least, you will find like these ceremonies where people uh, who are common believers get together in these collective like ceremonies you know, there might be music involved, there might be chanting involved, there might be some kind of like ceremonial ritualistic kind of element to it. Um, but, you know, people may be dancing, they may be chanting, but they will re reach this kind of like this altered state 
um, in which you know people may pass out, they may start speaking in tongues, they may start shaking. Um, you see this, people have like a out of body kind of experiences. And it's interesting, you see this in, in religions um, that are totally, you know, all over the world. Um, and so, you know, don't really necessarily have any connection with each other. Um, but they're really powerful kinds of intense things where people reach these, you know, almost like this out of body state of ecstasy. Um, and again, Durkheim's question as a sociologist is like, what is the social function of things like that? And he says, you know, basically the function of them is just that they, they, they affirm these bonds between the believers. They, they create a, a, a sense of togetherness um, and um, a sense of, um, you know, of, of like social solidarity. And he says, you know, in modern society, we don't necessarily quite have those as much. Um, we've become more individualistic. We kind of, you know, we associate that sort of religion with like superstition or some sort of primitivism, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, thing that we're supposed to, to outgrow as a scientific secular society um but uh we still do have them you know if you think about like you know concerts or you know festivals um music you know music festivals or sporting events um, where you have large numbers of people together and you know this kind of like crowd mentality you know takes over people um, that, you know, maybe drives them into a, a state of like uh, frenzy or, you know, near intoxication, you know, where they, they kind of, you know, do things that maybe ordinarily they wouldn't do because they're, they get caught up in this larger social uh, event, um, especially, you know, around like music festivals and, and sporting events, I would say. Um, it's again one of the things we're really missing in the pandemic where we can't you know people crowds of people can't be together um, it means that now we really don't have these you know kinds of collective effervescence um, but so you know religion and religious ceremonies are still the most common things the common places where you find people in this this altered state but um also, you know, in other kinds of collective gatherings that aren't necessarily connected to religion, uh, like music festivals or, or sporting events. Um, in these moments, Durkheim's belief is that these moments of collective effervescence are really important because um, it's like we pass out of the mundane existence of the profane world into a new kind of like ideal world and in which we can maybe get a glimpse of how a different world could be possible um, where one in which you know people are more connected to one another um, living in a greater sense of, of harmony and togetherness um, so in other words people may have an, a kind of an epiphany um, that you know may not last very long but still could give people you know a kind of a vision of people living in a greater sense of, of harmony and, and humanity. Um, so in other words, a kind of an ideal world can emerge out of this, these conditions of collective effervescence. Um, and Durkheim believes that this is, this is you know, an important thing. Um, you know, like all societies, these beliefs have to have these kind of reg regularly scheduled events, these kinds of like rituals or ceremonies where people get together and uphold and affirm the collective representations, you know, whether it's a, a parade or some kind of celebration, um, you know, um, any kind of like a an event where people who believe 
in similar kinds of ideas come together and their bonds are reaffirmed in a ritual, an assembly, a meeting, a ceremony. Um, I think Durkheim is saying this is more something that's really fundamentally human. Um, traditionally, it's been in a religious context that we have engaged in these kinds of collective gatherings. Um, but Durkheim is also saying it doesn't necessarily have to be in a religious setting. Um, and I would say, you know, one of the things we've learned from the COVID pandemic is just how much, you know, we're kind of missing those kinds of uh, collective gatherings. So in modern societies, you know, where you have more individualism, more secularism in the sense that religion is not as dominant, and um, also, you know, more based on scientific principles, these kinds of religious elements are in danger of, you know, kind of fading away, that modern societies are in danger of basically like losing touch with these older forms of ritual and, and collective representations from pre-modern societies. Uh, as Durkheim says at the very end um, on page 253, when talking about modern societies, he says the old gods are growing old or are already dead and others are not yet born. Um, but then you notice in this last, especially the last sentence um, of this chapter, he ends on a pretty optimistic note, hoping that, you know, once again, that, that modern society, you know, even if it's outside of a religious context, that modern society still has to find these uh, moments of effervescence. Um, and again, the thing is that, that's so powerful about them is that they generate these visions of like what a better world, what an ideal world might look like, right? So that, you know, we experience these moments um, that give us a glimpse that, you know, a uh, society maybe doesn't have to be so awful, you know, that we could maybe be more, more harmonious with each other. And Durkheim is, is hoping that um, even if modern societies are more secular uh, and less religious, that they will still be able to find room to um, create these moments of collective effervescence through rituals and assemblies and, and uh, you know, meetings and things like that. Okay, I'm going to stop the share now. I hope that that uh, has been a useful introduction to Durkheim for you, and I'll see you next time. Bye.